We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Keith Wiener. Keith is the president of the Gold Standard Institute of the USA, CEO of Monetary Metals, and also holds a PhD in economics. Keith, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Tom. So this is the time of year where everybody seems to be releasing their, let's say, their 2024 gold outlook. And it's no different for monetary metals. You guys just released your 2024 gold outlook report. And I wanted to speak with you to kind of review it for our listeners. So a big theme in it is thinking about cause and effect in the markets and the economy. So let's take rising interest rates, for example. How did the fastest and largest rate hiking cycle in history affect each component of GDP? So we need to break that down, obviously. And let's start with consumption. So how did we break consumption down to be able to understand it properly? So um, a lot of consumption is, is fueled on credit. And so um, credit gets more expensive. The theory is that uh, um, people should be doing less consuming. Um, I'm not sure if I said this in the report, but just thinking about it now, you know, that's the theory and the practice is I think a lot of people that are consuming on credit cards aren't necessarily thinking about the cost paid later. There's a lot of these macro assumptions, you know, like if unemployment goes up, there'll be less consumption and inflation will go down. And it's like, yeah, but we have this huge welfare state today. So that might have been true 100 years ago before the welfare state. But, you know, today, people that are unemployed, they don't have to eat any less than employed people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, you know, so, so, so the same thing with consumption, people putting things on credit cards. Now, if they're using home equity lines of credit, that may be a little more dried up, in, you know, so it'd be a marginal change, uh, you know, there. Mm-hmm. So th- another piece of that is wages. So how do higher interest rates start to affect wages as well? So um, obviously businesses need credit to just function, uh, even in a normal, um, you know, major major firms that are sucking mom and pops that would be probably operate 100% on equity capital. But major corporations, you know, have a choice as to how much equity capital, how much debt capital to use to finance the business. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, interest rates rise, then that capital is essentially pulling back. It becomes scarcer, um, or you could say the government's crowding it out, crowding out private uh, uses of capital. Because hey, why would I? Why would I take a risk by lending to a corporation, even if they have a good credit rating, versus the treasury dropping five and a half percent? Right. So uh, availability of credit uh, decreases. Um, you know, cost of that credit goes up, and um, so their ability to just simply operate, uh, you know, diminishes. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that I like to look at, again, I don't know if this is in the report, I mean, you only have a certain amount of space to say what you, you know, what you want to say. And we've, we've been good at pairing it back. It used to be a lot more pages in previous years. And I, I think it was, you know, feedback was just, it was just too long. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I look at everything from an interest rate, you know, lens. And um, so, you know, there's, there's a concept in finance, which is net present value. So if you have a stream of, of future payments, how do you figure out what the present value of that thing is, is worth? And um, so let's say you had a machine that spits out $1 per year very reliably. Well, okay, how much would you, how much should you pay for that machine? So the dollar spits out today is worth one, obviously. The dollar spits out a year from today, what is that worth? And it turns out that you should, you should discount that. Um, and that's, so there's, there's a discounting function and each future year is discounted by that many years times the interest rate. Um, and, the in, and the discount factor you should use is the interest rate. So the higher the interest rate, the more you discount you know, future years. The same thing is true, a wage is the cash flow. And so the burden of paying wage at higher interest rates is, is reduced. And the, the more the interest rate goes down, the more the burden of paying a wage increases. Um, so, you know, higher interest rates on the one hand, there's capital pulling out of enterprises and uh, they have to deal with that somehow. Um, and on the other hand, um, it does reduce the burden of paying that wage a little bit. 
so, you know, it's kind of a mixed effect. Mm -hmm. One of the other pieces, you know, you mentioned, let's say, consumers pulling out of their home equity mm -hmm. line of credit. And I think another piece that we, I don't know that we've really started to see yet is consumers actually selling assets. So, you know, when we see wages and everything else start to tighten up, is that the last piece of that puzzle that starts to kind of hit and when people need to start selling assets to make it? Yeah, I was going to say, but that's a consequence of when um, productive assets, you know, especially in a business context, are going down in value. Um, the you know the return that you need to get on your deployed assets in any business is a function of the interest rate. So if the interest rate's you know five and a half percent, and you're paying two and a half percent spread to that, right? As a sort of mid-sized firm, um, you know, so you're you're basically your cost of capital is eight percent. Well, you can't borrow capital eight percent to generate five percent on your assets. Um, you know, something has got to give, and um, at some point you have to start liquidating assets. The problem is the market goes no bid. There's nobody else who can make a business case for that asset any better than you can. Um, and so um, the Fed thinks that they're solve inflation by hiking interest rates based on a quantity assessment of money. But in fact, actually, all they're doing is raising the hurdle rate. And that no matter how much we destroy demand by laying people off and you know wiping out whole you know companies, no matter how much demand goes down, supply has to go down more. Mm -hmm. Such that at the end of the day, return on capital is marginally above cost of capital, um, and obviously that hasn't really begun yet. I mean, you know, you see the commentary like in commercial real estate over a trillion dollars of value has been erased so far. Um, you know, but th that's going to have real consequences. But I don't, I don't think they've really impacted us yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's a real art, and I certainly don't have it to figure out the timing. Of that impact, so so in my in my view, um, you know, employment um, and and ultimately GDP are downstream of credit. Mm -hmm. You got to be looking at credit, and of course, that's really the iron law of economics. Here is that cost of capital versus your return on capital, and we'll get back to that, Keith. But I want to get your thoughts on some examples, let's say, of lagging indicators that people use, and let's say ways of looking at economic data that don't give us an accurate picture of what is actually happening in the economy. You know, that's right in the report. You know, I talk about, um, there's some indicators that are like looking at the rear view, trying to steer the car. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other indicators that are looking out the side window. Um, so the rear view would be uh, employment, um, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of which is that, the Fed has trained Pavlov's employers, <laughs> Pavlov's dogs. I mean, how many head fakes have we had, you know, post, you know, the, the alleged recovery from uh, the global financial crisis? When I say alleged, it wasn't really recovery so much as papering it over with, you know, vastly more quantities of credit was issued to, to patch the problem of, you know, too much debt. Um, how many times has there been, well, we're going to hike rates or, you know, there's a recession coming? Now, when you're running a business, um, you know, if you understand the business cycle, what's called the business cycle, it's really the Fed's central planning cycle. But, you know, the, you know, the key is do your layoffs early or do one layoff, first of all. Don't have trips and drabs. It just kills the morale in the firm. You have to do a layoff when, when you know, you're a big, mature firm and your revenues are essentially proportional to the economy and the GDP is going down and, you know, McDonald's or Coke or Nike or Sony, I mean, their revenues are going to go down proportionally. That's how it is when you're that big. You've got to get ahead of it and do your layoff up front. And that way, as the economy is going down, you know, you've done your layoff here and all the way down, you're saving the money, saving the money, saving the money. When the economy hits bottom, and the first uptick pixel is when you want to hire and be ahead of, so you want to be ahead of your competitors on, on laying off on the way down, and you want to be ahead of your competitors and hiring on the way up. So you're prepared for the expansion and the growth, take market share from your slower competitors. Um, every time corporations thought that they would get ahead of the thing and do layoffs in what looked like a coming recession, you know, it, it was like Lucy with the football and Charlie Brown. <laughs> you know, they, they, you know, they pull it back 
and then you know the the you know expected recession didn't occur, and anybody who did layoffs regretted it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there were companies that came back and, and had to offer big raises and big bonuses and other things to beg staff that had just laid off a couple of months ago to come back. And um, so, you know, after after you've done that X number of times, of course, firms are very reluctant to lay off, even as conditions are worsening, because they're expecting the same things going to happen again. And um, so when they finally do, uh, you know, it, it'll be, you know, too late. They're going to get it wrong because the Fed has mistrained them on this particular thing. But anyways, the point is, uh, you know, employment is definitely lagging. I mean, generally lagging, but in this environment, even more so because of uh, of the Fed's Pavlov's uh, training. Mm-hmm. How about the yield curve inversion, Keith? You know, it seems like we've had this yield curve inverted for a dramatically long time at this point. Is this indicator broken now? I, I don't think it's broken. Um, I think you have to be careful in how you interpret it. And I've seen a lot of... Um, you know, there's there's an overarching debate in economics as to whether uh, you, you do reasoning from you know axioms or whether you just empirically just measure things. Mm-hmm. And the, the measurement camp would say, well, when when you have an inversion, especially if it's major and it lasts for a while, then when it uninverts, then that's the you know that's either the cause or at least coincident with uh, you know the onset of the recession. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I I think you what you really want to do is understand what's causing what and um so the cause of the inverted yield curve is the fed has hiked interest rates but you know the way this works is the fed really only has control over the overnight rate um and the, the, you know and obviously one week rate or one month rate is pretty closely tied to that so they can they can push up all the all the rates on the short end of the curve but the farther out you go the less you know people use the expression you know the fed is pushing on a string you know, a millimeter from the push on the string is still, you're still getting some pretty good action on that string. But, you know, 10 meters out, uh, it's not so effective anymore. So what, what this is showing us is that the market interest rate, uh, it, it doesn't want to go up, and the Fed can push it up on the short end and the long end's a whole, whole different story. So then you know, the uninversion occurs when the Fed aborts its attempt to hike. And you know we've been we've been in over four decades of falling interest rates, and so every time they've tried to hike, which has been a number of times over the years, they've been forced to take it back because the you know it's not recession per se in the sense of GDP. I don't think the Fed cares about GDP. They definitely don't care whether you have a job or not. I mean, I hope anybody watching this doesn't believe in the tooth fairy, doesn't believe in Santa Claus, and doesn't believe that the Fed cares whether you have a job or not. Um, you know, those are sort of three myths that should go by the time anybody reaches the age of you know six. But um, you know what they care about is is what's brewing in credit land, and the reason why historically and why they're going to do it again, I'm absolutely certain of this. Uh, you know, slam the interest rate back to zero is a credit crisis. You know, starts to blow up, and um, as they realize that you know you've just hiked. You know, in this particular case, this was a much faster more aggressive hike than what they did in 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we know what happened after 2005's hike. It took a while, right? It was three years-ish, uh, uh, you know, before it blew up. Um, and so they're going to be reacting to that. So anybody who's just looking at empirical data would say, oh, it's the uninversion. That's the harbinger of the recession. Well, no, it's the Fed is reacting to credit blowing up in, in, in their face or our faces. And, uh, you know, by slamming the interest rate back to zero, which would uninvert it, right? So if you pushed the overnight rate to zero tomorrow morning, then, you know, uh, the short end of the curve would slam right back down. And then the yield curve would be, you know, normalized again. Um, and so, you know, then you could say, well, that was the, that precipitated it or whatever. Well, it wasn't the uninversion. It was the Fed reacting to something else. Uh, and, you know, by the time they're reacting, it's too late. You know, the credit crisis is now baked in the cake. And, you know, defaults are happening. Other things are happening. The Fed can't, uh, you know, undo. The train leaves the station. And the Fed is reacting after that. So, Keith, you know, you mentioned this, this, let's say, this era of 40 years of falling rates. How does that end up really driving everybody in the economy up the risk curve to try and find a return in that environment? Yeah, so, so let's say, 
let's say you're just running a regular business um, and, you know, and, and you had a normal interest rate environment, which wouldn't be zero, uh, so suffice to say. And, and there weren't central planners, which meant that, you know, people had to choose what the interest rate was that they would accept in order to part with their with their money for, for the duration. Um, and so, you know, you get returns on capital that are, you know, above that. And in that kind of world, a business can, you know, business owner can thrive and, and it, you know, it works. But, uh, you know, push the interest rate to zero, two things are happening. One, you're enabling a great use of leverage because leverage is dirt cheap. Um, and then two, you're kind of requiring it because the return on invested capital is, is down. You can't really survive an unjuiced, you know, just a straight return. Um, you know, you need to augment that by 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 adding, to, you know, to capital. Now think of a financial firm where obviously you have very good access to leverage through your prime brokerage account. And again, you have to because you're not going to make your nut, um, you know, unleveraged. Uh, so, you know, everything becomes more brittle. Everything is, is um, you know, much more sensitive to a, a small drop in revenues or a small increase in interest rates. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a toxic, you know, it's, it's sort of poisoning the, the blood of the economy. So then, you know, that obviously ends up creating zombie companies and companies that are just dependent on these super low rates. Is there a way to understand how that ends up catching up to the economy once those rates go up? Yeah, so so um, I, I think it's important to say zombie is not a term from some dark, dank corner of the internet. It's actually a term coined by the Bank for International Settlements, mm -hmm. you know, the central bankers, central bank in Basel, Switzerland. And a zombie company, and there's a few stipulations about basically it's kind of hopeless and they're not, you know, they're not like a high growth company that are going to get out of it by growth. But, you know, basically companies' profits are less than their interest expense. And of course, you pay interest out of profit. So if your profit's less than that, you, you can't even afford to serve, forget paying the principal. You can't even afford the debt service. And that happens, um, obviously, in a very low interest rate environment um, and uh, a very permissive. A, one almost might say promiscuous uh, environment of lenders where, I mean, it's not like the lenders are stupid. It's not like they can't read your, your, your income statement to see that you can't afford the debt service. They get that. And they're, you know, Mr. Bodrovix, I, I realize you can't afford this loan. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh, which is just how insane monetary policy is, how distorted everybody's decision-making processes are, how corrupted, if, if I can dare use that word. Um, so, you know, you have a company that's that's destroying capital, basically, right? Because it's, you know, you're borrowing, and let's say you have $100 a month interest expense, but your profits are only 90 So you're $10 a month sinking deeper into the hole. And um, that's not sustainable. I mean, at some point, you run out of other people's money, as Margaret Thatcher once said about something or other, um, you know, in a different era. And um, so that... That you could use the term. That's a that's a bug in search of a windshield. That's a bubble in search of a pinprick. I mean, it's it's unstable. It's, it's necessarily going to come to an end. And obviously, if you raise interest rates, then you know that precipitates it. So, um, you know, we did a thing in our podcast called Zombie Month. It was you know October, so in honor of Halloween, and we had a bunch of guests talking, you know, great like academics that were talking about zombie companies and this whole you know phenomenon. And uh, before interest rates started, you know, before the Fed was hiking rates, 20% of all corporate debt out there was zombie debt. 20%. Now you've gone from, you know, an interest rate of effectively zero to an interest rate of five and a half. Mm -hmm. How many more companies that had been above the margin previously, that is at 0% plus whatever spread they pay, uh, they had enough revenues to cover, or enough profits to cover their interest expense. But now that you've hiked interest rates by five and a half percent, no longer now they're you know below the margin um you know it's very hard to say it's kind of like how many workers are productive and able to earn their wage with a minimum wage of 750 an hour and then if you hike the interest you know that's sorry the minimum wage to 15 dollars an hour how many how many workers are suddenly rendered unemployable because they don't produce that much well you, you know hike it and find out right so we hike the interest rate now so far um you know, for a variety of, of uh, can-kicking exercises. This hasn't blown up yet. 
um, you know, the spread between junk bonds and treasury bonds has not really widened, um, you know, a lot. In fact, in the last couple of, couple of months, it's actually been declining. The spread's been getting tighter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Fed has a lot of different ways they can kick the can, um, you, you know, but eventually, you know, reality uh, has to set in. Keith, when we add in all kinds of useless ingredients to this equation, like taxes, permits, interference in labor markets, does this continue to put pressure on GDP? I was going to say, first of all, it puts pressure on margins. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a firm's ability to pay wages and uh, service debt is impaired every time they add another useless ingredient. Um, so I've just been reading stories now in the UK, uh, you know, small mom and pop family owned pubs. Are, are going out of business or seeking buyers. Uh, they just can't survive anymore because they've had so much of their green energy restrictions and, and a lot of other useless ingredients. Um, so uh, your question was about GDP. Uh, so, um, you know, obviously a firm that suddenly is making lower margins, something's got to give, whether it's um, cutting back the hours of the workers which is going to impair their ability to buy consumer stuff or laying off some workers, which is obviously going to impair uh, in some degree, although we have a welfare state. And it's going to impair the take home profits for the owners, which you know, the owners are spending. Of course, owners don't get welfare. Welfare is just for the uh, hapless slump and proletariat. But if you own a business, no welfare for you. So if your profits go down, um, uh, you know, and, and of course, a small hike in cost can be a big. Uh, reduction in profits because uh, you know profit margin at the end of the day can be three percent. So you know a two percent hike in costs has decimated profits by two thirds. So yeah, so owners are going to spend less. Absolutely. You know, as we're as we're talking about, let's say the GDP equation, what is one of those components that isn't interest rate sensitive? It seems like government spending is everywhere and always you know, a phenomenon in this environment. Yeah, so the, the government is a non-economic actor, which to the people who favor government spending, that's actually a feature, not a bug. That is, you know, economic actors have to think about things like revenues and, and expenses, and the government doesn't. And so, of course, you know, interest rates go up, whatever the government can spend more if they feel like it. Mm -hmm. I just tweeted today, you know, people are posting this graph of what's happened to the interest expense on the government debt. And I'm like, guys, there's tens of trillions of dollars globally, dollars, U.S. dollars that are owed. And every one of those people is, number one, paying higher interest rates than the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Number two, they don't have the Federal Reserve to finance their debts the way the U.S. government does. And number three, in many cases, their, their revenues are in another currency, which is falling against the dollar. And you're worried about the U.S. government. The U.S. government's literally the last debtor in the world that you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. It'll be all the other debtors. Um, you know, first. So, um, well, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Right along those lines, though, Keith, why is credit even tighter in many other markets than it is in America? So, um, you know, credit pulls back at the margin. I mean, everything happens at the margin. That's sort of, you know, a number one rule of economics, really. Mm -hmm. uh, things happen at the margin. And the U.S. is the center. The other countries are, you know, some other countries are really at the margin. And so the U.S. tightens credit conditions and U.S. consumers and businesses feel it a little bit. Then just imagine, you know, the end of that long whiplash, how much they're feeling it in, you know, in other places. So, you know, you see things like the Turkish lira collapsing. Argenti okay, Argentinian peso is a basket case, but, you know, a lot of currencies are collapsing and the ones that aren't collapsing are certainly declining. Um and, you know, ability to get credit is much harder. And of course, again, the, those businesses, their revenues are in things like Malaysian ringgit, Turkish lira, whatever. But that, and very often they have debt in U.S. dollars. So now you're trying to service the U.S. dollar debt at a higher interest rate. And the currency that you're getting is your revenue is going down. And so your dollar debt is going up. Um, yeah, they're getting they're getting absolutely whacked. So. You know, this this kind of brings into this idea of supply and demand. Why doesn't the, let's say, the supply and demand equation that you learned in high school work in the real world, Keith? Well, the first problem with supply and demand is it's a static snapshot. 
um, and, and and the real world is a dynamic system. And and not only that, but it, it generally is trying to essentially look at one variable, which is you know quantity, uh, you know quantity supplied or quantity demanded, and then sort of make some predictions based on that. Um, but in the real world, so so if you have a, a particular day in a particular market, you know, let's say there's a, a rice exchange somewhere in India, and you know the price is settled at X, you could sort of play the thought experiment. Imagine if the amount of rice that came to that market that day was cut in half, what would it, what would the price have been? Mm-hmm. And so it encourages you to sort of play God, and and you know sort of imagine, okay, I can come in and sort of teleport and change one thing, pluck one number out, put a different number in, and replay almost like a computer game you know, same scenario and see what would have been different. Mm-hmm. But in the real world, all you can do is, you know, if you're a government, you can force some condition to change. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if you're a private business, you can change your own condition, your own production or your own demand or whatever. Um, and the point is, but everything's connected to everything else in, in the real market. And so everybody's responding. And so as the price of one, let's just say starch staple, is going up, then there's a lot. The marginal, the marginal person is switching his custom to something else, and the marginal supplier of that of that commodity to other markets is now diverting and saying, "Well, geez, the price is going up over here. I can make more money. It'll take me another day, and it'll cost me another whatever penny per per bushel to in shipping cost, but I'll divert." And so you get all of these, you know, call them pr- primary responses. And then that ripples and you get secondary and tertiary and so on. And at the end of the day, um, you don't get at all the nice neat uh, uh, you know, supply and demand curve thing that um, you know, people assume. Now, when it comes to money, it's even worse than that because the supply of treasury bond debt is also the demand. They're one and the same thing because what we call money is actually a thin slice of the treasury bond contract. So, uh, you know, the idea that, oh, there isn't going to be demand for treasury bonds is literally meaningless at a mechanical level. It's like saying that, um, you know, something's going to happen in physics and your mass will go to zero. It's not even possible at a physics level, you know, to have an object to have no mass, um, at least until we invent a new physics or say, well, you know, at, at something beyond the speed of light or in a black hole or you know, something like that. But, you know, in normal situation, to be an object is to have mass. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just one of those physics things. And people are fretting about, oh, the U.S. government's going to have to sell so many bonds this year, and you know what if what if demand isn't there? All the people are going to wise up to it; they're not going to buy it. And I challenge them and say, okay, how are you going to hold the money balance and not directly or indirectly finance treasury bonds? How do you plan to do it? It's not even possible mm-hmm. to hold the money balance. Means either to hold physical paper. Federal Reserve notes that you're lending to the Fed who's going to buy the bonds, or you're going to deposit them in a bank account, and the bank, by business model and by regulation, is going to buy the bonds, or you're going to go directly to treasurydirect.com and buy the bonds yourself. Those are your, those are your three choices for holding a money balance. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the idea of trying to use supply and demand and figure out how that's going to affect interest rates, it's just, it's just you know, meaningless. It's like, you know, one of those old things about calculating how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. You, know, you arrive at the number 17, but there's no reality to it. I mean, it's just a, just a fantasy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a forced circle, if you will. And, and as you put it, the idea of just looking at supply and demand is like looking at a two-dimensional object in a three-dimensional dynamic moving space, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So I want to get back to something that you said earlier, and I think it's worth reinforcing here. Does this all end up coming down to return on capital needing to be greater than the cost of capital? That is a huge, huge, huge part of it. And, um, you know, so uh, this, uh, I'm trying to remember what his name is, uh, Daniel Kahneman just passed away a couple of days ago, and he was the psychologist who came came into the economics profession and um, you know, famously debunked the idea of rational actors or rational expectations. Right. And, you know, without getting into the whole song and dance of how economists define rational, which I don't necessarily agree with, 
But there are certain basic iron laws, and one of which is if you're borrowing at 10% to finance a business that's generating 6%, you're dead. It's not a matter of whether you're rational or not. Um, you know, markets kill irrational actors. I mean, you know, not, not literally, but metaphorically. The capital will be taken out of your hands, even if you psychologically want to continue. You know, the capital will be taken out of your hands uh, involuntarily because mm -hmm. you're squandering it, at least in a free market, and if you're not getting a crony bailout. Um, you know, so if you can tap into the government's largesse, I guess you can continue it forever. So, um, but the government isn't big enough to subsidize everybody who's, um, every business whose uh, return on capital is less than its interest expense or cost of capital. Um, so uh, you know, anybody, that's not true. R, you know, R has to be greater than I, and anybody where R is less than I is dead. And, and it could take a while. I mean, there's a lot of things that cause lags in the system and, you know, various small business administration loans that, you know, no rational private actor would ever give you. There's a lot of things that they can do. But eventually, you run out of can to kick, or run out of road to kick that can. Mm -hmm. And um, again, very hard to predict exactly when, but there's a certainty. That's the iron law of, of economics. Mm -hmm. That in the long run, it's not going to be violated. So does that mean then, Keith, that prices must rise massively to match the new cost of capital unless the Fed cuts rates again? Yeah, so think about, you're running a hamburger stand, and at current market pricing, um, you know, you're generating, um, I don't know, let's say a 5% return on capital. I don't know what was normal in the hamburger industry before rates went up. I'm just going to guess 5%. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, the hike's the interest rate, and now it's basically 8% to you, 8.5 or 9 or something like that. I mean, so way above, you know, so you can't just say, well, I'm going to get higher return on capital. I mean, business management's hard. And, you know, it's not like business managers are stupid. And they don't realize I need to get my return on capital. But what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Right? So you say, well, just raise prices. Um, and a lot of people, like, you know, the left thinks, okay, well, we'll just force them to hike, hike, um, you know, you know, hike their wages. And then the right retorts and say, oh, that's just going to cause inflation. They're going to jack their prices. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You could try to jack your prices as you could have yesterday, the day before the, the minimum wage hike. And the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to lose volume. Mm -hmm. Right? So people today are paying, I don't know what, I, I haven't been to McDonald's in probably a decade. I don't know what they're paying anymore for a hamburger, but, um, you know, let's assume it's, you know, $2. Now, the thing with McDonald's is, of course, you know, the hamburger is cheap. And they really nail you on the fries and the drink. So the hamburger could be two dollars, and the and the fries are a five bucks, and the drink is you know. So you end up walking out with twelve dollars, you know. But but the, the the price of the burger is like a lost leader in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I said anyway. So uh, at at the prices you're charging, um, you get a five percent return on capital. It's okay, hike the prices. Well, volume is going to drop because the consumer doesn't want to pay three fifty for the hamburger. At 350, yeah, you get your return on capital up, no problem. Mm -hmm. The only problem is nobody wants to pay that. And so you're going to lose your customers. So the only way that return on capital across an entire industry is, I mean, yes, one really, 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 really smart entrepreneur can find some clever things to do to cut costs and increase revenues and basically take market share from his competitors. But across an entire industry, there's only one way it's going to happen, which is an awful lot of supply destruction has to occur. Mm -hmm. If enough stores, with each store that goes out of business in your sort of local area, it gives you a little more pricing power because there's fewer stores into, to divide all the hamburger appetite into. And um, so obviously, uh, you, know, uh, um, you, know, each, you know, you can still keep the same volume as before and raise your prices a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then another store goes out of business. So the survivors eventually raise the prices enough. But this is a process of destroying everybody down to you know whatever remnant survives i don't think anybody is is equipped to to deal with what that's going to look like from a layoff perspective what that's going to look like from a bank balance sheet perspective because all these companies are in debt mm -hmm. and when they close they default they're on their debt obviously um and how many entrepreneurs and investors are going to be wiped out um this will be called austerity on steroids or they're going to coin some term for it 
nobody's going to want that. Um, so yeah, the, the market is going to reward only the very best actors that are that are in need of that capital, right? Well, but also the luckiest. So it depends on when you got your loan, mm -hmm. what your cost of capital is. Sure. Um, you know, and, and ironically, the ones who got it longer ago, first of all, they may be closer to paying it down if there is such a thing still left on the markets. But at higher interest rates, they put less uh, cost, you know, restaurants that were built 20 years ago just, you know, weren't as big and opulent and glorious as restaurants that were built, you know, let's say during zero interest rates, you know, post uh, uh, 2008 bust. Mm -hmm. So if you had a more modest restaurant, because that was the prevailing you know, interest rate at the time, you needed a higher return on capital. You couldn't blow as much building your storefront out. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, interest rates hike. So you end up being one of the survivors. Is that because you're better? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's not going to be any room for slow, stupid entrepreneurs, but you may not necessarily be any smarter than anyone else, but your capital position is a little bit different because of the timing of things. Um, you know, I'll never forget during the 2008 bust, uh, General Motors was desperate for a bailout and Ford wasn't. Everyone said Ford is smarter. No, Ford had refinanced all of their short maturity debt in the spring, uh, I think it was late spring, if I recall, of 2008. And GM had been planning on refinancing it in, in either fall of 2008 or, or uh, Q1 of 2009. Just the timing of when the rollover happened. And so when the music stopped, Ford happened to be by a chair and they sat down, and GM happened to be the one that was standing by no chair. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of happenstance to this. And Kane talks about this and you know how it's everybody's impo impoverished and a few are arbitrarily and unjustly enriched. There's a lot of arbitrary arbitrariness to it. So Keith, let's get to let's say where the, the rubber meets the road for people that that are listening to this how does all of this affect gold prices and what was the call from last year's outlook on how gold would perform in this high rate environment so I, I'm trying to remember what I said last year but um uh you know I, th I think I said you know we're not confident the silver is going to go anywhere and silver didn't go and it had been and we said that the price of gold is likely to rise and unless there's a major crash mm -hmm. precipitated by, that, by the interest rate hikes, which didn't happen. And the price of gold was up, as I recall. So this year, and this is the, uh, the hazard of writing, and then you have marketing and production. It takes a certain amount of time to put out mm -hmm. uh, you know, a high production value, glossy, like our market outlook report. Um, you know, I called for $2,300 gold. And uh, at the time I called for that, that was actually a significant prediction. Here we are. And uh, so I'm in Dubai. And so it was, it was my, my daytime, but it was your overnight. You know, gold's at 2281. So anybody reading the report today is going to say, oh, that wasn't much of a prediction at all. <laughs> yeah. 300 into the year. Here we are 19 bucks away from it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a function of the lag of, of when I wrote it versus. Uh, so I, I, think, I think we said um, 2300 or you're probably over 2300 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're just sort of generally in the bull market. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as regular readers or, or viewers of, uh, of your show, or at least my interviews on your show, know that, you know, our anal analysis of supply and demand in the gold market is based on the spread between spot and futures, mm -hmm. which is called basis spread. And what's, what's really notable is every time you know, let's say so the gold price peaked in August of 2011, right? And then it was it was a sideways to downhill slide for many years. Arguably, 2018, 2019 is when you know we finally came out of that. Um, every time the price would blip, the gold community would say, "Oh my God, it's going to go to the moon!" And I would look at the basis and say, "The basis is rising." And so that's the spread between futures and spots. So there would be bidding on futures, push up the futures relative to spot. And you can just see it. It's like the futures market's not going to take anything anywhere because that's speculators trying to front run what they imagine is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because, you know, Bernanke or, or Yellen or now Powell would say something and they thought, oh my God, it's going to make all the difference in the world based on whatever 
half-baked theory they have, which is usually wrong. And you could just see it time and time and time again. We had article after article after article every time. You know, the price would blip and the articles from the gold sector would come out predicting whatever, 2,500, 3,000. It's like, no, not going to happen. This time is different in that the basis hasn't been rising with this rise in prices. This rise in prices has been driven by physical demand, not in the West. Right. So if you're looking at um, bullion dealers in the uh, US, Canada, you know, the UK and, and you know, sort of Western countries, demand right now is, is slow. This is physical demand in the East. Um, and it's real. And obviously it's durable. And and the other thing that's weird is normally that's the demand that dries up when the gold price goes up. And and so far it hasn't. And I think because you know, we're in a different macro environment than we were from 2012 to 2019. That's, that's what I think this means. And I think eventually Western buying will turn back on, um, perhaps at the wrong time. Perhaps all the Westerners will pile in, you know, near the top or they'll drive it to the top and then, you know, things will peter out. You know, we'll see. But, um, you know, cl clearly there's a reason why the price of gold, which, which I just think inverse the dollar going down, there's a reason why the dollar is going down. It has to do with all that debt and the unsoundness of it. And, uh, you know, people are scared of what our monetary masters might do next. Mm -hmm. So, Keith, what do you think happens when the Fed is forced to cut? Obviously, you know, they're going to be reacting to something exogenous in the markets that they don't necessarily want to have to react to. But does a different gold bull market emerge at that point? Well, I think in the, whatever the crisis is going to be, um, that's not a time to be betting on asset prices. Mm -hmm. That's a time to be betting on US dollar. Um, I think this time around, so, so price of gold dropped, um, you know, roughly 30% from its peak in spring of 2008 to the low in, you know, fall of 2000. I think there was a day that might've been 660 or something like that in the fall, but very brief. Uh, but let's say 700, like 30% drop. And then within a couple of months, gold was making you know, new all-time highs. So gold, the gold price went down less than other asset prices and was the first to go on to make new all-time highs. Stocks was still a decade or something before it actually retained, regained the high of, of where it had been in, in uh, 2007. Um, this time around, I think the price of gold will drop less because this is more monetary in nature, and I think there's less leverage in the gold market um, because there's been more volatility this time versus the quote-unquote stealth gold bull market of 2002 to 2008. Um, you know, enable people to put on more leverage, and I think there's less leverage sort of in gold generally, and the people that love leverage just aren't really that attracted to gold. I mean, you can see the Bitcoiners are almost, you know, talking meaner, meaner, you know, your assets are going up that much. So the people that are looking for leverage, or, you know, people that are using leverage are looking for an asset that goes up faster. Gold just has been fairly boring. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the leverage that for, it's the forces the liquidations. And, um, you know, gold is, you know, under less leverage, then you'd expect this price will drop less. But it's, it's probably not an environment for um, rising prices, at least initially, until you get through the acute phase of the crisis, then everyone's buying gold as the safe haven play. Mm -hmm. So coming out of that, yeah, I think we'll see, you know, significantly higher gold prices. Um, uh, but yeah. So Keith, what do the SOFR and LIBOR rates t have to tell us about this story? And how can we determine a fundamental price for gold from them? So, um, well, first of all, LIBOR, they're not quoting it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, make what conspiracy theories you will. Uh, so the difference, LIBOR is an unsecured uh, uh, credit rate between banks. That was, was the rate, uh, or if, if banks are still lending on an unsecured basis, they're not quoting its rate anymore. That, that was or is the rate that on an unsecured basis without collateral. SOFR is the secured overnight funding rate if you're putting up treasury bonds as collateral. And so the, the opportunity for conspiracy theory here is that they killed the indicator of, um, so so far it's just basically a reflection of, you know, Fed policy. But LIBOR could deviate, especially in times of market stress. If there's stress going on, then the rate 
you know, banks become reluctant to lend even to other banks. And then, you know, LIBOR as a rate goes up. And um, so now it's not quoted in, it's like they stopped quoting M3, you know. Every time they stop quoting something, it's like, well, why Why don't they want you to see that? Mm -hmm. um, so um, what, what we do in our fundamental prices, we're saying, okay, you know, the future price, you know, price for gold and for future delivery should be higher than spot because the, when you're buying a futures contract, let's say for next month delivery, somebody has to carry that gold for you. In the meantime, and the, the lion's share of the carry cost, especially in gold, is the interest rate, right? So someone is borrowing dollars, buying gold, parking it for you and selling it. And they're only going to do that if there's a, a positive spread, uh, you know, net of the interest. So, um, that sort of gives you an idea of where the future price should be relative to spot. And then as the future price deviates from that, I, I kind of think of it as you have two posts, right? That are, you know, stainless steel posts sticking out of a table. And there's a rubber band stretched fairly tight, but not that tight, between the two. And there's some times when the market is pulling, you know, sort of pinch the rubber band and pull up on it. And that's when people are bullish in the futures market. Yeah, and they're using leverage. So you know, they can pull the price up and get it out of whack for a while. And there's other times when they're kind of depressive. So there's manic and there's depressive when they're pushing down on that rubber band and they can push, they can short futures with leverage and push the price, you know, below. And um, so we have a calculated fundamental price that attempts to back out the action of the futures market. And it's okay. If we just had a purely physical only market, um, you know, which, by the way, is subject to the same problems as I was saying earlier about supply and demand. This is not a perfect or exact science, you know, by any means, because if you didn't have the futures market, dealers wouldn't be able to hedge. The market would have all sorts of other problems in it. Um, but we're attempting to figure out, like, OK, where where would metal be clearing if the futures, at least if the, if the speculators in the futures market weren't pushing the price one way or the other? And, um, you know, that price as of the time of writing the report was, you know, for both gold and silver, significant market. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the exact dollar amount is, is not necessarily uh, uh, accurate, but when you see day after day after day, it's above, and especially as the trend is rising, you say, okay, there's tightness in the market. Um, again, not retail products in the U.S. You know, retail products, the premiums have collapsed, uh, but, you know, underlying metal in the commercial market um, you know, it's being pulled, you know, everyone says, oh, your yeah, metal flows from west to east. And that's been pretty much the narrative in the space since I've been, you know, following it starting in fall of 2008. Mm -hmm. It's not always true. Mm -hmm. There's times when it's just is. Right now, there's a time when it is. It is a time when it is. It absolutely is. Um, so that's, you know, part of why I'm here in Dubai is because things are booming here. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sure uh, an interesting development to see this demand for physical that seemingly hasn't hasn't let up and it's interesting to also see the effect that that has on the market as these prices are set on the margins as you said so so one interesting thing about dubai so there's a gold souk here that's basically an area of the city that there's all these shops kind of an outdoor thing you know mining all the streets on both sides is uh you know just basically uh you know shops that sell gold a lot of them call jewelry, but you have to understand in the East, jewelry is monetary in nature. Um, you know, a lot of it's very crudely fashioned. It's 24 karat. You, you know, it's you, it's money. Um, they're selling something like two to four tons of physical gold product per day out of the souk. Wow. Um, mostly a cash business, I might add. Um, and... You know, Dubai is a city of you know several million people, but you know that's not native demand. That's you know tourists flying here, buying the gold, and then putting it in their pocket and getting on an airplane. So you know, if it's two tons a day, right? I mean, that's four, five, six, depending on how. I don't know. I, I think they're open seven days a week. Um, that's certainly uh, you know on the order of five, six, seven hundred tons a year of unofficial export from Dubai. Mm -hmm. You've never seen that statistic. Because it's not going through any export channel. It's someone who's buying it locally retail, just literally tucking in his pocket, getting on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can walk on an airplane with jewelry and you know, no, no problem. 
bumps. Um, and so that's another reason why it's crafted, into, most of it's crafted into jewelry. You wear it, and one of the customs people are gonna say, hey, look, this is my bracelet. Mm -hmm. It happens to weigh three ounces, and it's just really chunky and crude, but <laughs> you know, customs officials can't criticize your taste in jewelry, it's kind of ugly, you know? But anyway, so you get, you, get, you know, you, you, I, I think in India, they're allowed to bring in a kilo when they, when they go abroad or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of tons a year, j just at the retail trade level. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, it's another one of those pieces of these markets that it's hard to take into account, kind of going back to that idea of looking at a two-dimensional object versus being in a three-dimensional space that's dynamic. So, Keith, right. I want to I want to thank you for explaining all these things for us today. For anybody that is interested in looking up the 2024 Gold Outlook Report, it's available at monetary-metals.com. And of course, Keith is available on Twitter at RealKeithWiener. Keith, anything to add? That's it. Uh, Monetary Metals, we pay interest on gold in gold. Everybody should know that. Absolutely. There's your yield back. There's the yield. That's right. We're paying a real yield and real money versus uh, what you get in paper nowadays. Yep. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time today, Keith. Thanks for having me, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.